Hello everyone, I am Carla Kopp. Um, I am a board game designer, developer, and publisher, and I'm here with the truly amazing Amari Akil, who is, um, he's part of the Board Game Brothers uh, Publishing Company. He has also designed Rap Gods, Hoop Gods, and Oh My Gourds, and he also is part of the Pathways Fellowship, um, but he can also tell you more about himself. Um, Amari, what things did I miss? <laughs> hey, um, I mean, yeah, it's funny. I have to like go through a mental checklist in my head too. I'm like, what things did I miss? Um, well, I, I also uh, do content creation for uh, Tabletop Backer Party. Um, I also uh, wrote a micro RPG that's coming out in a, um, a book in, in November. Um, that was my first time doing that. And yeah, I, I have so many projects right now, it's, it, it's hard to keep up. Uh, but those are the big ones. Those are the big main ones and the ones that are publicly known, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, your show is called The Breakdown, right? Yes, yes. Uh, we've been theorizing a new show, actually. So The Breakdown might be changing into something else um, that I think might be a little more fun uh, and interactive because that's the thing with the breakdown because it's pre-recorded we miss out on a lot of the interaction so um, we're looking at, at changing that up a little bit so surprises are coming mm -hmm. wow that is exciting well i do like the breakdown but like new exciting stuff is always new and exciting right yeah for sure um so today we are going to be talking about highly thematic games because well you make highly thematic games um so to start off, like, um, uh, I played Hoop Gods, um, I believe it was about a year ago at Metatopia. Um, Probably, and, yeah. Yeah, so long. Um, but, like, while playing Hoop Gods, like, you had incorporated, like, the mechanics with the theme so much that, like, I was, like, analyzing what I was doing. And in doing that, I was, like, learning more about basketball and how to play the game and, like, the different, like, cadences during throughout the game um and I thought that was like really awesome um so like how do you like really get like that thematic with your games like why do you think your games are just so thematic yeah um I mean my first my first thought for this question is that as a game designer I think like one of the directions you typically want to go is you want to make games that are fun for you and I think I just so frequently get attached to theme and how theme integrates with gameplay mechanics that I automatically like go there when I'm thinking about my own games because that's just what I like. That's what I find fun. And I end up, yeah, just spending a lot of time and energy thinking about that specific thing as I'm making games. Um, Cause I just, I just, I love when, you know, the, the theme can almost seamlessly integrate with the gameplay and i think it just feels good i think for me and so i just constantly i'm moving in that direction yeah that makes a lot of sense um so like do your games always start out thematic or do you add in like more theme like as you iterate um that that's actually a really interesting question um because I like to think of myself as like a theme first designer. Um, but a lot of times that that doesn't always lend itself to a gameplay mechanic automatically. So a lot of times you have to think about uh, some sort of mechanic to start out too, to like at least start you off on the right, on a path. And then you find ways to kind of bring the theme into that specific mechanic. Uh, and it it, we, it happened very differently too between rap gods and hoop gods. For rap gods, it was the theme was the theme didn't automatically give us any kind of ideas about gameplay. It was like, well, it's hip hop. A game is not going to just pop into your head when you think about hip hop. Like, there's no there's no components that come to mind. So we really had to like take that idea from like get all the ideas from the theme and that basically meant we had to break down ideas related to hip-hop and just break them down to the point where it could kind of suggest a mechanic 
um, which that to me is really kind of like very theme first. Um, but we went into Hoop Gods with a, with a different idea. We basically said we wanted a basketball game that was uh, in a lot of ways dependent on dice as like the main component. We didn't know how we were going to use them exactly, but we started with, okay, we want a dice-based basketball game. And I, I think that helped us to streamline the process a little bit. We weren't going from scratch. We weren't like, we did with rap gods. We weren't like, what is basketball? How do I turn basketball into a game? Uh, we started with that dice centered uh, concept and we went from there. So I think even in terms of deciding what, whether or not, you know, you're, you're choosing theme over everything else, there's a little flexibility and you can lean more into the theme to drive the mechanics. And then sometimes you can just pick a few mechanics and then use the theme to drive how those mechanics like work and relate to each other. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you have like one of those that you like better than the other, do you think? Um, for Hoop Gods, it was way easier to get to a place where the game felt good um, because we we really, we had a pretty solid idea to start with. like. We knew it was going to be dice based. Um, we knew we wanted like manipulation of players on the court. We wanted that visual aspect. We wanted that table presence. Um, and it was just a matter of like, okay, we're using dice. How do we layer all of the pieces of basketball on top of that um, with using dice as the driver? And yeah, we went through several different iterations. It started off as like a dice building game. Um, so you started off with a very small sort of basic uh, group of dice. And as you played the game, you were adding dice in to your pool to be able to do cooler and better things. Um, but that ended up being anti-thematic and ended up leaving the game at some point. And so for us, it's always, yeah, trying to figure out that balance between what is the the mechanic. But I think that process still... I think was was a little easier to me um, and just, I think, made the game come together a lot quicker, which is really nice as a designer. So I'm not going to complain when things sort of work out. And I think, yeah, going that route, at least having some mechanically, like mechanic concept in mind to start really can help move things along a lot faster. As long as you're willing to throw it away if it's totally not going to work, too. <laughs> For sure. Um, so you brought up the whole, like, anti-thematic with, like, the dice building. How often, like, after you play tests, like, do you think about theme and things being anti-thematic? Is that, like, an every play test sort of thing? Or, like, do you have, like, oh, every month, like, let's really think about theme and how everything works? Uh, I would say that that in a lot of ways drives every single decision like the like every play test we're looking out for the things that happen in the game that don't fit the theme well um and it, it doesn't mean we necessarily change things but we're always looking out for that so i would say yeah during every play test i have like thematic radar on and i want to i want to know if something if something looks weird to me based on the theme, if something feels out of theme for other players, because they're going to have different, they're going to bring different things to the table and understand the theme differently. So I, I'm constantly, constantly thinking about it and looking to see, yeah, if, if things are, are working together. And I feel like that probably is what drives all my games in that direction because I'm constantly, constantly thinking about it. So does this mean that you try to get like very specific play testers? Like when you were doing Hoop Gods, did you try to get like a lot of people that were really into basketball? Well, that is only a challenge for us because not only are our games or one of our focuses for our games is being highly thematic, but we also want our games to be very accessible to people who aren't familiar with the theme. So we have to do a lot of both. We have to 
introduce uh, and have play testers play the game who do know something about it. Um, and we also have to have play testers who know almost nothing about it in order to actually reach our goal. So the we don't typically seek out one or the other unless we're really lacking. You, But we do ask those questions at the beginning of all our play tests. It's like, how familiar are you with the theme and how the theme works? And that gives us a lot of information in terms of, yeah, just being able to gauge how all these different types of people are going to react to it. Because um, we want everybody to have fun. That's the whole point. And yeah, so making sure that we do have a wide variety of testers is is pretty important. But I do, I lean on, uh, you know, people who consider themselves experts in the sports. We have a lot of like social media activity and people, you know, sort of name dropping basketball players or rappers um, or talking about stuff that sometimes I don't even know anything about. <laughs> but um so yeah those are the kinds of people that we lean on when we're working on games because they bring so much extra knowledge and yeah oftentimes have really good suggestions about things that can go into the game um that we may have never thought about like actually today uh this morning someone commented on one of our hoop gods uh tweets um mentioning a a real life basketball coach that was really good at managing the game during like the final seconds so like which is like a, a clock management thing which we had never really thought about in our game it exists at the end of the game uh, in some cases but they basically suggested to have like a special card or a special ability that would allow some of that clock manipulation because there are players and coaches who are really good in that scenario. And so it made total sense. And we never thought about adding the clock manipulation as a, as a special ability. We were focused on like, you know, the player's physical abilities and skill. Um, but that's also super valuable and it does fit within the theme. So, yeah. Yeah, I love going to Twitter just because you can get like so many answers if you just wait a few hours. Like, it is impressive. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I probably learned that from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the more questions you ask, like the more people will just love to throw answers at you. And like some of them are super great. Um, yeah, that's why I was asking about ghosts today, too. <laughs> I'm working on a game that has some ghosts in it. I was like, I'm just going to ask because that's what Carla would do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes me really happy. Um, yeah. Um, I also like you brought up the whole um, how familiar are you with this theme like that question um, and I've never even thought to really ask that and like I think if I've ever have asked that it's like a like end of a, the um, play test sort of question and maybe I don't even like um, correspond like the play testing data with it but I think that's a that's a really great idea to like start off like how familiar yeah. are you so you can like put all the rest of their answers kind of in context. And it's not just the their, their answers that we put into context. So sometimes it changes the way that we play test. Um, so for instance, if we're, for who gods, when, when we were trying to really ensure that people who weren't familiar with basketball could play the game, um, when we asked that question, and if, especially if both players are like not super familiar with basketball, like the terminology during those play tests, sometimes I'll text my brother and be like, okay, we're going to be super quiet in this one. We're going to let them drive the questions. We're going to let them drive the, the things that they either need to know or don't understand. Cause if we wait for them to kind of add that input in or ask those questions, then we learn exactly what are the things that that type of player needs. Um, and so we, we actually changed the way we're going through the play test because of that answer. Uh, and it can, can serve a lot of different purposes, I think, in terms of, yeah, what you actually can get out of it. I think that's like so smart. Um, like, especially the like being quiet and like having the play testers identify like the areas that they just don't understand. Um, I think that's the great and like, not like true blind play testing, but like it has those uh, aspects of blind play testing that can really like 
show you like what needs to be clear like early on. Yeah, and I don't like blind playtesting. So I try to sneak in elements of blind playtesting through a lot of the other uh, playtests that we do to, you know, in different corners of the game. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to talk about this thing at all. Let me just see if the cards tell them how to play uh, or how to use this part of the game. Um, and I think that makes my blind test a little easier when I when I get to the point where I'm doing them. Oh, yeah. Like, I need to do that so much more because, like, as you said, like, blind play testing is not fun. And, oh, gosh. Like, I end up doing it so much. But, like, if you do it, like, in little increments as you're play testing the rest, that's super smart and great. Yeah. So, um, going back to, like, the thematic um, aspects and the mechanics, like, how do you make sure you're capturing the right mechanical parts of a theme? Like, instead of just creating like a simulation like yeah choosing the right aspects um that that part is so hard and oh we we struggle often especially in the beginning because in the beginning you want to capture as much of that theme as possible and you're like yeah i want we want these things and oh that would be great yeah that happens in the game we in the real life, we definitely want that in the game. And um, you identify a whole lot of stuff that is a part of a theme that you feel like has a will fit in the game. Um, and you end up just taking a lot of those things out because I, yeah, that's the kind of the root of the question is like, it doesn't always work out that well. And a lot of the times the only thing that, you know, is a, that feels like a good response to the, that scenario where something doesn't really match up the theme is like, well, we're doing it because it's more fun. And yeah, so what? It's going to be slightly less thematic, but it's more fun and it's more enjoyable for the player. And we have to kind of give credit to that being the most important thing all the time is that player experience. And so that's really the, the only times where, you know, sacrificing uh, a mechanical theme matchup feels okay is if it's purely because it's going to make the game absolutely better and absolutely more fun. Um, and it's, it's so hard to identify that in the beginning when all of the pieces are kind of changing rapidly and, and it's much harder to do. Um, but I think we, we do a pretty good job. And this is actually one place where I lean on my brother's opinions a lot um, because he's still relatively new to board gaming. Like I've been doing it for eight years um, and we started designing together three years ago, but he still hasn't played the number of games that I have. He hasn't spent as much time thinking about design specifically. So when I'm play testing with him, he is has a much easier time, I think, just identifying whether something is fun or not fun. And I can I can lean on him for determining, okay, you're absolutely right. That was me just trying to like make this mechanic work in a cool, clever way because I'm I'm I wanna be the smartest designer. And he's like, nah, that's weird, man. It's not fun. <laughs> I'm like, you're right. All right, trash it, get rid of it. Let's let's go back to the drawing board. Uh, so it's nice that we come from very different sort of gaming experiences and and design sort of perspectives where he can just like yeah knock me over the head <laughs> when i'm when i'm just doing something just for no good reason oh yeah but i i fully understand that like when you were saying that i was like yes that that is me because like like well as designers we find like these weird things to be fun like like uh i have a game where i'm like okay, but what if it ends and that person gets extra points and then everyone else gets another, like, turn? Like, are we doing this because it's different than anything else I've seen <laughs> and that's fun for me because I've never experienced it? Or is it, like, is that actually fun? Right. Is it actually, is this actually a good idea? Yeah, I ask myself that so often. And, yeah, when I'm, like, adding something to the game, I'm like, yeah, this will be super cool. And he's like, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, great. I need that. 
Uh, yeah, it's great that you have that person. And like just knowing that like maybe I, just reaching out to somebody that doesn't play a lot of games and just being like, hey, is this fun or is this just like overly complicated for no obvious reason? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. Um, oh, yeah. So when you're making a thematic game, like how much do you think you need to know about the theme to make it thematic? Ooh, like me personally? <laughs> um, I think like at one time you said um, something about like you don't listen to like all that much hip hop. Yeah, well, I go through phases and I think, you know, when we were making the game, I was making sure that I was listening a lot more. And it's still one of my favorite musical genres, but I also did a lot of blues dancing and like got into electronic. So I'm all over the place in terms of my music. So I, I don't know also specifically, I don't know a lot about like new artists, like all most of my hip hop knowledge is like late 90s through the 2000s. So I'm solid there. I'm so solid there. But newer stuff, I, I don't know as much. And so yeah, it's sometimes like, especially like jargon and slang and different sort of like styles and elements of, of newer hip hop, I'm like not super familiar with. So there was, um, we actually got some feedback on our uh, art and like the fashion in the game that it was a little bit outdated at some point and I was like oh is this not what people wear now <laughs> is this not the the hip like stylings of hip-hop artists I don't know um so but I, I think in general though you you don't need to be like incredibly intimately like into whatever theme you're making, but you do need to do a decent amount of research. And I always default to uh, asking somebody who just knows better than I am. Whenever I'm confused about something, I'm just totally dependent on somebody else. Or if I have a good idea, but I'm not sure, I'm like, is this actually how it is in the world? I don't know. Um, so I, I had real rappers play the game and I was like, I, and that was one of my questions to them, like after the play test, I'm like, how well does this reflect things that you experience as a, as a rapper or, or like the way that you um, kind of, the way that the game kind of reflects your experience or what you've been through, just like trying to build a career um and that that feedback was incredible so we got really good feedback about yeah just how it felt to play the game as it relates to actually being a rapper so if you can find experts on whatever it is yeah 100 percent, just do that it's way easier so uh do you have any tips for like finding these people and convincing them to play your game I don't. It, it's hard. <laughs> um, I actually like I pitched a podcast uh, to a company I, based on this premise alone of just like I want to take games about themes that weren't necessarily designed by people who are intimately involved with those themes. And I want to play them with like experts in that thing to see if they if they match up well. Um, that was the whole idea of the podcast. And yeah, and I think selfishly, I wanted that because I wanted to be able to, to have access to more of these experts uh, mm -hmm. in the case, you know, that I ever wanted to design a game about, um, I don't know, bugs. I would have someone, I actually do know a bug guy. So uh, <laughs> I, I have been contemplating reaching out to him and being like, hey, you want to help me out with a game? I don't have an idea yet, but I just want to know that you're on board if I need help. I mean, that's really good. Like, uh, well, because I also I have a friend who went to school for bug science or whatever that is. Yeah. Is it entomology or is that totally wrong? Yeah, yeah that, that <laughs> sounds right. Like, I've, I've heard her talk about it a lot and show the bugs, but generally, like, it comes to like that. Oh, yeah, you're going to tell me about the bugs. I'm just going to smile. <laughs> <laughs> you like this thing and it's cool for you so i'll just be here yeah 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 
I have refrained from uh, randomly texting bug pictures uh, to my friend Hamilton, who who uh, yeah has has that advanced degree. Be like, hey, what's this? Because I'm like, I'm sure you don't want this from everyone. But like, if they're passionate, like I had a person where I would like see a bird and I'd be like, what is that bird? And then I just send them a picture until they were like, you know, there's an app for this. You could just use the app. And it was like, use the app. But I like mm. you and you telling me about this bird. It feels so much better. But yeah, mm-hmm. I, 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 I think I think I'm better off not doing that. It'll give yeah. me leverage when I want to get that game made. I'll yes. be like, I didn't bother you for like three years. Now I need all the information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um. So, uh, going back to uh, like theme and mechanics or. Uh, this um do you have any tips or exercises to try um to tie like your mechanics more heavily with the theme that you're going for yeah I mean my my number one tip so what really for me what really seems to make a highly thematic game highly thematic is the intuitiveness like if you are a person who is at least somewhat familiar with the theme and the actions that you take in the game and strategies that you need in the game, if those feel intuitive, then you've probably done a good job. And so that's when you're playtesting, when you're really looking for feedback, that's often a great place to start to really figure out if you're hitting that theme is like, are those things intuitive? like without necessarily needing symbols uh, on the cards as guidance or like does it feel like the right fit and we have um one part of hoop gods that's interesting uh that people see it as a very thematic element of the game and it actually has no mechanical bearing at all and it's the symbols on the dice so the probability doesn't change for the symbols at all, but we only change the symbols to make them thematic in terms of the action that you're doing. So if you're shooting, that requires two hands and a ball. And we put that combination together because that's what shooting sort of feels like. And so if you are shooting and you're rolling dice really fast, maybe your brain will automatically make that tiny connection as you're playing and that's going to make it slightly easier even though the probability to roll two hands on a ball is exactly the probability of rolling three feet but we change them based on the action that you're doing and that makes sense to people and so yeah it like literally the symbols don't matter but because it fits in the theme it i think it overall just works better so it's stuff like that where you you want it to feel right and based on what the theme is and if your players are responding in ways that like give you the 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 idea that it does feel right to them um it's often hard to get that feedback directly and i don't know exactly what the questions that you need to ask because you're digging into somebody's intuition sometimes it's subconscious right so yeah, trying to ask the right questions to get to those answers is a little tricky. Um, but that's really what it boils down to for me is, is does it does it match your idea of what should be happening based on the theme, um, consciously or subconsciously? And if, if I'm doing okay there, then I'm probably doing okay. Yeah, I think like that makes a ton of sense of the whole like, doesn't match the idea of what what should happen like because i didn't think about that but like um when i did play hoop gods like i think you had the the hands for shooting and the feet for like doing movement stuff and like that it makes sense but like your brain doesn't like my brain didn't put it together until you said it out loud but like yeah then i remembered that oh yeah that that did make a lot of sense and the whole like your brain doesn't always know like like my brain probably like associated uh like the feet with movement like but i didn't know that i was doing it and that's one of the like such the hard parts about play testing is like nobody that is play testing will actually give you all the knowledge of what their brain has because like 
they're they can't mm. put it into words yeah yeah and yeah there's so much subtext in play testing and that's something me and my brother talk about all the time um in especially in a in a two-player competitive game we we talk about um the relationship dynamic of the two people playing and how that impacts a play test or how that impacts the the style of game that they're playing so like two strangers are going to be responding to each other and playing very differently they may be uh, more conservative whether if it like if you're playing with two friends or a couple and so you have to take that into consideration when you're play testing too there and there's so many little things like that that can come into play when you're when you're play testing so yeah it's never it's never easy to decipher all the things that you need to get out of play test but uh, i mean we try our best <laughs> Yeah, that that is a very important point that you bring up about like the relationships and people. Like, did you also try specifically to get like two people that didn't know each other to play the game, or did that just happen um, naturally? That that just happened pretty naturally. But I I mean I think it's it's a little bit intentional. So we we kind of set up our playtesting system. Um, it's really and just like anyone can kind of just jump in, right? It was like. You respond to this tweet and we send you a link and we go from there. And so we had a lot of random people just showing up and a lot of the playtesting events are like that too. Um, but we definitely really dug into some of the other playtests, like two people who, you know, would want to sign up together. We're like, yeah, we'll do that playtest. You know each other already. It's going to be weird <laughs> probably, but <laughs> we'll have some fun. Yeah. I mean, I, that's definitely something I'm going to start doing because, well, uh, a lot of my playtesting I do like with groups of people that know each other, like local playtesting, yeah. or like I did before the pandemic. Um, so like getting the certain feedback from like people that are like, that are perfectly willing to be aggressive at each other because they've known each other and gamed with each other for five years. Like that is a very different dynamic than two complete strangers. So. Yep, it's very different. I knew I play very differently. So um, I, I play usually if I'm playing with strangers, I play towards fun and I don't care about winning at all. Like I will make decisions in the game just purely to make things more fun for everybody um, because I want them to be into games, you know, more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, I once had like this awkward play test where it was like, people I didn't know so it was like a take that thing and I was like well if I was playing with someone I was completely comfortable like smacking them in the face or whatever this is what I do but since <laughs> I don't know these people that well I am just gonna do the suboptimal move and I'm just gonna hang back and like let them build whatever yeah. they're building not topple it over like um I don't know, but some people just can't understand like the whole, I don't want to topple somebody's thing over if I don't like know them. Yeah, it feels weird. It does. Um, so uh, we had some questions from the audience. Um, sure. Sean asked, um, if a game needs something to make it work, but it doesn't fit thematically, do you still put it in the game? Um, I mean, oftentimes, yes uh yeah it goes back to that that fun factor if it's and especially if it's like absolutely necessary and we have run into a couple of those situations where it's like you know what this is absolutely necessary ideally you can find a sneaky way to like twist it into being thematic mm -hmm. um so there have been a, a a couple things i'm trying to think of one specifically um where yeah it was like you know we absolutely need this in the game and that actually so the star date the beginning of uh hoop gods we had to change for first player and second player so whoever starts the game with the ball as and and is the active player we had to limit the amount of energy that they had they started with and that's just a balancing thing um that was absolutely necessary there's no real reason why the person who starts with the ball will have less energy to start out the game than the other player. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to we're going to word that in some way in the instruction book. So it makes sense with the theme. 
even though it's kind of a stretch. Um, so a lot of things, yeah, you end up having to do it. And if you can sort of make it work into the theme, that's better than not trying at all. Uh, so that would be my advice is, yeah, if, if you absolutely have to put it in, see if you can if you can make it even slightly thematic um because that'll help a little bit mm -hmm. yeah there's been plenty of times where i just like we we have to sit down and be like okay so we added this thing why did we do it from a theme yes. point and like yeah. how do you tie it all in with everything else because right now it's just yeah balance look because balance yeah. is so important to also fun like you don't want the first player to always win yeah we so the actually a bigger one that is in hoop gods um is the ability for oh we, we had such long discussions about this but as a when you're when you have the ball the only time you can pass the ball from one player to another is at the very beginning of your turn and we had to put it there and it has so many ridiculous implications if you let players do it any other way it completely breaks the game um and so that is one that like people hit on all the time they're like huh, why can't i do this why can't i and it's really that one is is nearly impossible to explain in a thematic way but it really is just essential to the gameplay that that has to work and it, it really has to do with sports games being very you know or, or in general like real life sports being very fast paced and action oriented and so putting this in a board game what we're doing is we're we're basically simulating tiny increments of time right so like how long does it actually take for a player to take like three steps and dribble a few times it's like a fraction of a second and so our, the idea behind having the pass be the first thing that you do is like you wouldn't be able to go through the process of making a lot of those movements and then make a choice to pass the ball without your opponent being able to respond because in real life everybody's moving at the same time so the way that we have to adjust for that is to force that passing in the beginning so you know it's it's it has to be a result of your decision that you made last turn, whether or not you're going to pass it. You need to position yourself to be able to pass it. And your opponent needs to be able to respond to that. And if you've done a good job, then you'll still be able to pass it. So it requires some forethought. And that's just because we're dealing with this, this idea that lots of stuff is happening in a short period of time. And we're trying to actually make it work in a game that's slowing that down by you know 10 times <laughs> and yeah it just had to be that way and sometimes it's frustrating and you know when i get that feedback and i hear people be confused about why that is and it's even hard to explain because it's just it boils down to um trying to abstract a real life real-time fast-paced thing into a board game and yeah sometimes painful but yeah it has to be done I mean, it makes a lot of sense because like, as you say, like you're, you're breaking something like that is simultaneous and not simultaneous. So there's going to be something that breaks down. Um, is the game still about robots? It's not. <laughs> oh, okay. No, oh, okay. no, we, we, we dropped the robots. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of conversation back and forth. Um, but really that was, that was also one that kind of came down to my brother it was that exact situation where I was like, it's great, it's cool. Robots playing basketball. I've never seen that before. It's weird. You know how much interesting things we could do gameplay mechanically with that? Like that was me. And he was like, but I just want to play basketball. I was like, ah, oh, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Like that's the game that we need to make because that's what we care about. And I'm just trying to make something cool and weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Just the simplification, may, like, will probably let so many more people like just get into the game because, like, they aren't like the weirdos like us that are like robots playing basketball. Like, <laughs> let's, let's think about this weird future event that like makes this all possible. Um, yeah.
and I, I mean, I just love sci-fi in general too. So like anything that like slightly leans that direction, I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say like if, if it was still about robots, it's just like the robots are programmed, they have to pass and then they do their other stuff. Like that's just how it works. But you know, like humans, we aren't programmed, we do whatever we want. So that doesn't right? fit as an explanation. Um, we had another question um, from the audience. Um, Jesse asked, um, how do you know when you've got the right mechanic for a theme? Ooh. Um, that one... So I, there's a lot of flexibility in that in that question. Like, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to say, like, really, that a theme is going to have a right mechanic. It really boils down to, I think you can make different mechanics work very, very, very well thematically. Um, we, we totally have the almost exact same game um, with Hoop Gods. We could totally do it with just cards, and it would probably be just as fun. Um, you can kind of help make those decisions by asking, you know, some of those questions that uh, we sort of went through before. But I would add on to that, that the emotional connections can help you sort of identify whether, like how right it is. Like, are, are you having a, an emotional experience that you might have to that theme or in the the in that themes sort of um in, in the the area that that theme takes place are you having the same emotional connection to that theme as you would have as you're having in the game and that might get you a little bit closer on top of just like mechanically does it work yes mechanically it works so that would be the difference between kind of a card based version of who gods and a dice based version of who gods the dice based version because it is physical because you're you're more physical in like rolling dice than you are in like playing cards ties just a little bit closer to a sports theme and so that was a big reason why we kind of wanted to go with with dice in the beginning and it does like and especially because it's real time dice rolling now your energy is like moving and it's and and your your heart rate is going up and so that ties more to the the sort of like emotional uh connection that you have with sports and so we probably um yeah have made decisions mechanically based on that based on like are is it is it a better emotional or psychological fit um than just a mechanical fit because a lot of times we're just talking about mechanical fit and that gets you that gets you like 90% of the way there but for that last 10% it's like you can you can lean more on the emotional fit of the theme of the mechanic and the theme together i think that's that's really insightful like just thinking about it all like even you just talking about how like it could have been cards but the physical like like um basketball is more real time and like doing things with your hands so that's why dice like just fits like like it makes a lot of sense um and that's really the the idea that you're going for so yeah yeah. high thematic games yeah require you to just like tune in a lot more to what the theme is what it represents and I think the way that you think about it, like we, you have to break down a theme in so many different ways to be able to find, figure out what the good matches are going to be. Um, you know, we we broke down rap gods, so many levels of of like, okay, what is what is hip hop? Hip hop is about storytelling. Okay, what does storytelling look like in hip hop? Well, it's very often about like. A from the bottom to the top. So like, how do, and now we break that down. I was like, okay, so what does the bottom look like? And what does the top look like? And how do we separate those and make them distinct and show progression through each? 
So like you're constantly breaking down every every piece of the theme to figure out what are the nuggets that I can pull out of this and put into the gameplay or turn into mechanics. Um, and so, yeah, just constantly breaking it down and you find a lot of interesting, cool things just by doing that, by dissecting the theme into all these tiny little components. I mean, that is such like an insight into your process about all of it, like, like breaking things down and putting them together. And like, after you do this all like a bunch of times, like taking all the things and then, then you have a game. So yeah, and we ended up, it was it was actually uh, such a process. And we ended up throwing most of it away. But when we were working on all of the all of the moves that you could do in hoop gods, uh, we started a spreadsheet and just started writing out like all the different like sort of classic moves that you could do in basketball and that list got so much bigger than we thought it was going to be and then we started defining all of them by dice combinations if, if we had to imagine them all as dice combinations and some of them made sense some of them made no sense at all and we had to come up with a bunch of weird dice icons to try to fit them all into the the, the structure that we were building and it was it was intense and it was so much but yeah that's just a part of the process is like yeah let me break this down into all of the pieces and then create a game out of it and then strip most of it away <laughs> is, is what ultimately ends up happening i mean i love it um we had um another question from kurt um What's it like working with your brother? And do you still fight like brothers when you make your games? I mean, we're lucky <laughs> because we're uh, we never really fought like brothers because we were just too far apart in age to actually care at all. Um, so it didn't we, we never really experienced that. And I would say probably in our in our three years working together, I feel like in terms of the company and and game design we've only had one fight that i can actually remember um that was meaningful in any way and we like didn't talk for like one day and then it was fine it was like not a big deal <laughs> and i don't even remember what it was about but i remember that sort of happening once so we're lucky we never fought as a childhood he was like my idol i wanted to be just like him because he was older and cool and he was like this little kid doesn't matter that much he can run errands for me and i would like get yeah i would like run downstairs and make cereal for him and be really excited about doing it because he was the coolest and he would just be playing playstation i'll be like yeah this is the best i bring you some cereal i get to watch you play video games it's great <laughs> uh, well that sounds like a great re relationship um so uh, we're getting towards the end of it. Um, do you have anything exciting happening for you in the next coming weeks? Next coming weeks, I am running a Kickstarter that is launching on October 21st, uh, and that's for Hoop Gods. And it is very exciting, but as, as we all know, running Kickstarters is also very stressful and time consuming. And uh, we're, we're really excited about it though. We, we are, really gearing up for for i think what's going to be a, a much better campaign than our first one well, we've been around long enough and and i think we've done a good job at building a lot more community around the games that we're making so yeah who god's uh gonna be on kickstarter october 21st and we'll be talking about it so much over the next few weeks uh, we just got our pre-launch page up so people can go and click uh, follow on the kickstarter page which is very exciting. Uh, I wasn't even sure about that process because that didn't even really exist last time when we were <laughs> working on a campaign. So yeah, mostly mostly just good things related to uh, to Hoop Guys. And we're going to have some surprises in this campaign for people. So um, that's, that should be exciting. And yeah, going to be talking about that soon too. Okay, well, yeah, that is super exciting. And well, I hope it goes really well. Um, is there anything like you're specifically doing differently between this campaign and last campaign? Um, very specifically, we decided to 
just bring the best game to everybody out of the box. So we're not doing any like component upgrade stretch goals or anything like that. Um, we're really just like, we're going all in. We're going to start out our campaign. We're doing engraved dice. We're doing, um, yeah, like every everything that we want in the game is going to be there. Um, and so our focus, we actually are going to have some stretch goals, but they're very different than what you might imagine. So that's one of our, our surprises that we're going to be putting out there, um, hopefully in a few weeks, but we still have some work to do on, on making all that work. Okay, well, I am excited to see where you go with that because, yeah, like, um, it's always interesting to see, like, how Kickstarters change over the years, like, uh, when people started doing stretch goals and then stretch goals got crazy, um, and now you're going some different direction, and we'll see, like, um, how that all goes. Um, yeah, I mean, we're doing something that fits with our brand, which I think uh, is is most important, but it's it's probably different from from what anybody is expecting in terms of stretch goals. So we'll see how it's an experiment. We'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so where can people find you after all this? Um, you can find me, my um, designer, uh, sort of Twitter is just my name, Omari Akil. Um, if you're looking for our company on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, it's BG Brothers and um, very, very interestingly, um, I decided to start a Twitch channel and I just kind of put that up too. So um, if you are looking for that, it's Akilaverse. It's my first or, or my middle name, uh, A-K-I-L-A-V-E-R-S-E. Uh, -E. And so I'm hoping to actually do some more design uh, oriented things as well as just like random playing games. But uh, I want to do some design stuff on there too. I feel like Twitch is a weird, mysterious place to me. So that's going to be very experimental and I'm just going to see what happens. Well, I hope it goes well. Like, I think a lot of us are just experimenting and putting like things on Twitch and like trying to see what works. Um, I know I am, so yeah. Yeah, it's a it's the wild, wild west for board game this year, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and finally, um, for people that don't know what the Pathways Fellowship is, um, can you describe what it is and how it's making a difference? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Pathways Fellowship uh, was kind of started. It was it was a group of people who wanted to be able to specifically help out uh, game designers of marginalized groups, um, and basically. Our focus was trying to help them in, in actually meaningful, tangible ways. So we got a lot of feedback from folks about, you know, what are the actual obstacles that they run into and, and how to help them overcome that. And so um, right now we're, we put out the first application for people to apply to the fellowship. Um, and we're going to be, because everything went crazy this year, we were supposed to be um, bringing, basically paying for people to go to conventions, but that has such since changed. Um, so now we're trying to figure out the best ways to help folks. And uh, I think for some people, we're going to be, um, you know, helping them get potentially computers that can run a uh, tabletop simulator and getting them some training on tabletop simulator, stuff like that, um, to be able to get their prototypes out there. Um, and eventually we will be supporting um, folks in terms of getting to conventions, buying tickets for conventions as well. And yeah, that that group, I'm I'm really excited to see where it goes to see with our first sort of cohort, um, how we're able to help them. And and I think I think it's going to be good. And uh, we're starting small and uh, hopefully I think things go well and we can grow the group and grow the the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited to see what it does, too. Um, well, because like all those things are really important, especially now, like. There's so many people, like, they don't even have computers that can run Tabletop Simulator. Like, I know I have, like, a pretty good one, and it, like, it definitely overheats, so. Uh, yeah, I did not realize how much of a beast TTS was. <laughs> I, but, yeah, apparently it's 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 worthy of some, some additional specs if you need it. Um, well, thank you so much for being here, and thank you everyone for uh, watching and participating. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was great. Yeah. Bye.